Did the officials cause the Jets to lose a point against the Montreal Canadiens? We'll talk about why and why not on tonight's episode of Locked On, Winnipeg Jets. You're locked on the Hockey Jets, your daily podcast on the Winnipeg Jets. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Good evening, friends, and welcome to tonight's episode of Locked On Winnipeg Jets, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I'm your host, Harrison Lee, an avid Winnipeg Jets fan and an online blogger. You can follow me on Twitter at Asia Living Loco and at LO underscore Winnipeg Jets. Thanks for making Locked On Jets your first listen of the day every day. If you like what you're hearing, be sure to like, follow, and subscribe on all of your favorite podcasting platforms and YouTube. Doing so, of course, is always free of charge and ensures you never miss another episode. But most of all, we just love and appreciate your support. Tonight's episode is brought to you by GameTime. Download the GameTime app, create an account, and be sure to use promo code LOCKEDONNHL for $20 off your first purchase. Stay tuned to hear more about how GameTime can save you time and money when when it comes to buying tickets to your next sporting event or concert. Now, like I said at the top of the episode... Big question, right? Did the, the the officials for tonight's game against the Montreal Canadiens in Winnipeg Jets cost the Jets a win? I feel like there's two sides to this answer. And for me, right, I want to lean towards saying in, in a lot of ways, yes. Uh, this game was very frustrating for a lot of reasons. It wasn't the worst game the Jets have ever played. But like one of these uh, things that we've seen with the Jets this year is that Against weak teams, sometimes it takes the Jets a while to get going. And in other areas, it feels like Winnipeg, I don't know if they slightly underestimate their opponents, but it sort of felt like the Jets were expecting Montreal to beat themselves in this game and got lulled into a bit of a false sense of security, especially after having such big showings against the LA Kings and Colorado Avalanche. We'll talk about the Avs game later because that one was really cool and is worth uh, getting excited about. But this game, I felt like the Jets were a little bit below their standard, especially for the first 30 to 40 minutes, right? The Jets didn't really get going until about halfway through, uh, maybe towards the the third period. It sort of felt like the Jets were kind of skating in molasses, and on the power plays that they did earn, they weren't exactly great. Now, I'll say this. Uh, one thing that really stuck out is that, you know, the referees let a lot of stuff go, and it was very strange what they let go. I saw so many infractions that were more like holdings and interferences and all sorts of stuff that was just mind-boggling that, you know, neither team was getting called for it, and you just knew at some point it was going to lead to a really controversial sequence. Now, (laughs) on top of the really questionable, you know, lack of penalties and stuff, The most controversial thing of the night might have been the goal review, right? Josh Anderson with a hand pass, or at least what looked like it, uh, across the slot for a goal that maybe shouldn't have happened. Now, I'll say this from my perspective, right? I think the biggest problem is this was ruled a goal from the start. And when Bones challenged it, you know, the, the hand pass did happen. But the problem is, you know, you couldn't really tell if the puck touched Anderson's stick afterwards. And from the video review and stuff, you really couldn't see anything conclusive. It's why they took so long on the review. And while I tend to lean towards, um, obviously, as a biased Jets fan, I feel like this wasn't really a goal, uh, or at least it should have been, should not have been ruled that way. You know, unfortunately, it being ruled as a goal to begin with then set a very high standard for the video room to have to overturn. And, you know, looking at the video evidence and stuff, I think the war room kind of got it right. And not because I think that it wasn't a hand pass, but more that I just didn't see enough to really overturn the initial call. It would have to be very clear and obvious. And, you know, putting aside the fan lenses, I didn't see it. Maybe further analysis will find some sort of minuscule uh, piece of of pot or rubber that somehow avoided the stick. I don't know. But from all the video footage, Uh, I would hate to have been one of the video review folks because like looking at what was available, there just wasn't evidence enough to overturn the call, even if the league might have actually thought the Jets were right. All that said, you know, it doesn't really change the fact that the Jets were not good and kind of put themselves in a position to get scored on. Right. 
you have to, you know, play this game the full three periods. And the Jets kind of took a while before they started doing that. Now, by the third period, Winnipeg was in full stride and they were sort of back to what they do best, right? Creating tons of opportunities. And despite going down, you know, two nothing earlier in the game, the Jets rallied back and tied it thanks to some good efforts and finally cashing in on some big rebounds. But, you know, at the end of the day, right, I, I just feel like this was a game where maybe the Jets played a little bit down to the competition and special teams, again, were a huge storyline where in other games they maybe haven't been as much because the Jets were scoring at will at even strength. But in this game, the power play was a big problem and the PK did not help. We'll talk about special teams later in the episode, um, especially because it seems like it might be more of a present um issue for the Jets than uh, I, I was expecting, maybe something that the coaching staff is finally picking up on, but kind of circling back to the officiating, right? I said that I thought I was kind of leaning towards this having cost the Jets, and I really feel like the, the sequence at the end of the game where Ehlers, uh, he was first off interfered with or something, I don't even know what you would call this, holding maybe, uh, Savard grabbed on the Ehlers' shoulder, dragged him back across the blue line almost. Ehler stayed on his feet and created a scoring chance, but that right there was a very obvious call. It wasn't even slightly uh, questionable. It was a straight-up penalty that Savard got away with. Then you had the sequence right before overtime where uh, Ehlers got interfered with by, I think it was Anderson setting a pick somebody did at the blue line, and then it caused Ehlers to be late to his man. Uh, there was like a central puck carrier right in the middle at the top of the slot. And Ehlers had to lunge out and dive to try and stop the puck, which obviously, you know, the skater's going to continue on his path. He tripped over Ehlers' stick. That's a clear penalty. But I don't understand how the original penalty right before wasn't called because had that actually been officiated correctly, the Jets would not have been on a PK for the end of the game and then into overtime when Montreal won. It's very frustrating because it felt like it really did shape the outcome of the game. And that's not to say that the Jets necessarily deserve to win, but based on the third period performance and stuff and how much the Jets were creating and seemingly the tide of the game really turning, I'd actually argue the Jets were probably uh, on in route to like a two nothing or like a, a a two points, right? I felt like the Jets were on the verge of winning this game, but that PK really screwed the Jets, and it does kind of feel like the refs generally screwed Winnipeg in this game. And I'm not going to sit here and complain about the officiating because there have been plenty of uh, you know like times when the Jets have been gifted stuff before, but it felt like in this game, it just in this moment really frustrating that the officiating kind of stood in the way of what was a pretty big Winnipeg comeback effort. It sort of felt like the Jets got punished, you know, for, for really just not calling the rules. And it's really frustrating that it continues to be a problem. It's not just something that happens to the Jets. It is a league-wide issue, and the officiating continues to be put under a microscope because, quite frankly, it's dog water. Uh, this is some of the worst officiating we've seen in a long time, and I think the officials are under a lot of pressure. They're struggling to make the right calls and keep the game management to a minimum, but at some point, the league is going to have to do something because this BS cannot continue. It is, you know, it's unacceptable, the standard of refereeing that we have in this league, and the fact that, you know, ownerships and stuff are, are kind of, generally on the quiet side about things makes me worry that it's going to continue for a while longer. But at the end of the day, you know, I can't really complain that the Jets got a point out of this. You know, it wasn't the best effort from Winnipeg. Um, they still at least got something out of it, but it would have been nice if it felt like the game wasn't completely ruined by the officiating. Thankfully, the Jets had a much better game earlier this past weekend against the Colorado Avalanche, and we'll talk about why this game kicked so much butt in just a little bit. Before we go any further, though, I do want to shout out our friends and partners at Game Time. When it comes to buying tickets, you know, a lot of us often go to concerts or sporting events, and, uh, you know, you're, you're going to spend a lot for tickets, right? You're expecting it. You're expecting also, once you get to the venue, lots of uh, souvenirs and stuff. You want to buy a few drinks, maybe some food. You start adding all of that up and the costs multiply quickly. But just buying a ticket, right? You get hit with uh, hidden service charges, extra fees, all sorts of stuff that you weren't anticipating so that what looked like an easy $50 hockey game suddenly turns into $150 before you know it. Game Time knows your pain, and they want to help out with a great app, the Game Time app, which allows you to get killer last-minute ticket deals, flash sales, and so much more 
all backed by their lowest price guarantee and event cancellation protection. Game Time wants you to save time and money and also gives you in-venue seat views so you know what you're actually paying for. You're not going to get a mystery seat that's a complete you know, grab bag of views. Maybe you end up behind a pillar. Maybe you get a prime seat in the nosebleeds. Look, Game Time doesn't want you to, to, to mess around right, and waste your money. They want to make sure that you're actually having fun and that you get to experience the event you want to in the way that you want to. So if you want to take the guesswork out of buying tickets, go with Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and like I said, use code LOCKEDONNHL for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account and use promo code L-O-C-K-E-D-O-N-N-H-L for $20 off your first purchase. Download Game Time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. Hello, friends, and welcome back to this episode of Locked On Winnipeg Jets, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Every day, thank you so much for rejoining us in tonight's episode as we talk about uh, a string of recent games, one of which was maybe not the happiest against Montreal. This past one, though, against the Colorado Avalanche, an awesome game, one that I think everyone uh, was excited about. And I think it really reestablished the Jets as a true top contender in the Central Division, maybe even the best team in the Central uh, if you look at some of the other teams and their recent runs of forms. Now, before we talk about what made this game so special, just wanted to let you know about something really cool that the Locked On Network is doing. We have launched the first ever national sports 24-7 streaming channel on YouTube. Locked On Sports Today is here for you 24-7, covering the top stories of the day with our local experts from around the network and our national shows covering every league. Go to Locked On Sports Today on YouTube and subscribe to the first ever national sports 24-7 streaming channel. Now, like I said, right, circling back to the Jets against Colorado, this was another game where that magical top line of Ehlers, Shifley, and Velarde seriously went off. I mean, this group has been... In Fuego, they have dominated competitions. Uh, they've smacked down almost every line that they've come across. And once this line avoided the Devin Taves defensive pairing, suddenly they feasted on Colorado. The Avs really had no response. And after that, you know, the, the supplemental lines like the Nemestikov line and stuff started feasting on the leftovers. We saw, you know, tons of contributions up and down the lineup. The fourth line, I thought, had a really solid game. You know, this was just a, a really nice outing for them from the Jets against a team that, quite honestly, is really good. And look, I, I will say this, right? The Avs were without McCarr, uh, which is a huge difference maker, right? Kale is one of the best defenders in the whole league, but not because he defends exceptionally well. He's immensely good at transition, puck carrying, and he's a huge power play threat. But at the end of the day, right, the Jets can only, you know, take what they're given and, you know, face the teams that sit ahead of them um, as they are. I mean, there's no selecting lineups, right? So the Jets just had to take care of business, and they did so emphatically. What I especially love is that it felt like, you know, after a big performance against L.A., you thought, would Gabriel Velarde continue uh, his recent run of form? And the answer was, heck freaking yes. Velarde has been... Uh, really on a bit of a warpath, and in this game, you know, he notched a couple of goals, and it just felt like a really big validation of, you know, once again, the Jets having a huge trade win with LA. I really felt like at the time that it happened, Winnipeg very much got the better end of the deal. The fact that the Jets got like three players and a second round pick out of it is pretty darn amazing. If you would have said that, you know, Dubois and Velarde were just being traded one for one, I would have taken that even back then. But the fact that, you know, the Jets got several upgrades up and down the lineup, plus a pretty good draft pick in the second round, you just really can't hate it. And it really has, I would say, turned this franchise around completely and readjusted Winnipeg's entire competitive window. Uh, so props to Chevy for a really big trade. It made a huge difference in this game. We also saw Niederreiter getting in on the score sheet. Ayafalo had some points, including a nice little backhand goal. Uh, Ehlers had some points. Just a, like a really good vibes game. Uh, I really felt like this was a performance where pretty much Everyone that Winnipeg has recently acquired shown in some way, you know, Nemesnikov had points as well. It it was just 
you know, all of the more recent arrivals, you know, chipping in offensively, showing why this Jets team is so much deeper this year. And Colorado, you know, is a traditionally high flying team for much of the second half of this game. They got nothing like Winnipeg just would not give them an inch. And sure, the Avs definitely had a couple of chances to score and did notch two goals. But on the whole, right, Winnipeg generally silenced what has been a very fast, very productive offense. Uh, Colorado has greased through opponents this year. They are very happy to run up the score like 5-1 on you in very quick moments. And somehow the Jets kept them from doing pretty much any of what we're used to. Uh, the McKinnon line was generally quiet. Rontanen really didn't have too, too many crazy looks. McKinnon himself was kept uh, pretty quiet. I mean, the Jets just did enough to really see this game through in a very dominant fashion. And overall, you got to love it, right? This is exactly the kind of performance that you'd hope Winnipeg would continue after a triumphant win against the Kings. And sure enough, they did it again. It's exactly what you love to see. You know, would I say it was the perfect game? No, of course not. You're going to have moments where you make mistakes. But on the whole, right, the Jets got the job done, and it was about as emphatic a victory as you could possibly imagine. Now, where the Jets probably won't be as thrilled with uh, is, again, some of the special teams not being ideal. They did, if I recall correctly, have a power play goal in this one. So uh, at least that, you know, finally chipped through. But, you know, the power play recently has been um, a bit of a talking point, a big sore point and sore spot for this team. And it happened again in the Montreal game this evening where, you know, once again, special teams continue to be uh, one of Winnipeg's boogeymen. And it's weird because you think about the Jets and a, a, a strong power play. And in years past, that's actually something you would have associated with this team. We'll talk about what has gone wrong for the special teams this year and whether it's something that's fixable in just a moment. Before we go any further, though, I do want to shout out our friends and partners at FanDuel. As the weather gets colder, the NFL offers stay hot on FanDuel. Right now, new customers can get $150 in bonus bets with any winning $5 money line bet. That's $150 if your team wins. As a Ravens fan, if you're also a Baltimore fan, this is probably about as no-brainer of an offer as it gets. Maybe, though, you like to live a little more dangerously and you want to cast a $5 bet on the Vikings. Sure, they might be around a 500 team and they might struggle to really make the playoffs, but you know what? Maybe it's Minnesota season. Maybe it's time for Minnesota sports to step up in a big way. No matter what, though, all you have to do is cast a $5 bet, and if you win, you get $150 to try your luck again. If you've been thinking about joining FanDuel, there's never been a better time to get in on the action than right now. The app is super easy to use, and there's a wide range of betting options, including spreads, player props, over-unders, and so much more. Visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and kick off the NFL season in style. FanDuel, official partner of the NFL. Hello, friends, and welcome back to this episode of Locked On, Winnipeg Jets, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Every day, thank you for rejoining us in tonight's closing thoughts as we wrap up this show with some concerns about the power play and PK. Uh, like I said at the top of the episode, you know, this was a game against Montreal this evening where, look, as as much as the shot clock and everything might have tilted heavily towards the Jets, especially towards the end of the game, what ended up being one of the biggest defining moments was the fact that the power play just could not get it done. The Jets had multiple opportunities, two of them, in fact, while the Habs had three, and Montreal scored on two power plays while the Jets scored on zero. Um, that's just not really good enough, and I think for this you know, this season and in previous years, one of the things that has always stood out is that the power play is really static. One change in particular that I didn't really understand is why Shifley ever went to the flanks. When he was down the middle in the slot, this power play was super dangerous among the best and most lethal units in the league. Stastny was like on the bumper. You had line A at one point on one of the flanks. It was a really well-balanced unit that seemingly had weapons at all angles, and even then, this power play still wasn't 100% perfect, right? Because you have to give up something somewhere. It's impossible to have, you know, 100% perfection. But that unit in 17-18 was about as close as you will ever get. And since then, the Jets have kind of been chasing a better power play for years. But this year's power play and, you know, honestly, last year's power play 
it, it's so static and it's really hard to understand why. I'm fairly certain the coaching staff is not telling the guys to stand around and wait for something to happen. And yet, when the Jets go out there with a the man advantage, that's kind of what they do. Uh, it was very much a problem when Kyle Connor was healthy. You know, the, the power play didn't really move enough. It was very static. And it always defaulted to KFC as the shooter, which often became a very predictable pattern. Now you have situations where, thanks to the lack of, you know, a clear one-time option, the Jets are cycling the puck more. They're doing more overlaps. You're seeing more rotational changes, but it's still not fast enough, and it's still not causing PK Diamonds enough stress to where they're falling apart and the Jets are getting easy tap-ins. Winnipeg has scored a couple of power play goals over the past few weeks, but it really hasn't been at the rate that it needs to be, especially in games where, say, the Jets might be facing either a good goaltender or the 5v5 finishing falls off a bit. Your power play has to be one of your big trump cards, and for the Jets, it's really been a huge hindrance. Uh, the, the, the Jets' power play is just so static, and when guys are off the puck, they really need to be rotating into different spots, trying to find you know opening uh, openings and lanes where they can you know really catch a PK diamond napping. But in this case, the Jets just sort of skate around and skate around and hover around and wait for something to open up, and that is really not going to get it done. And it's interesting that Rick Bones bonus was asked about it this evening, and he did say that you know guys weren't skating enough. That's it. That is one of the biggest problems. There's too much staticness, and you know we need to overhaul not only the power play, but also the penalty kill that really hasn't been getting it done and applying enough pressure. I guess my question is, why would he mention that now? Because it's been a problem for years, honestly. It's not just a, a, a this season problem or even a last season problem. It's been a, a consistent bugbear that has haunted the Jets for many, many seasons, and it has seemingly gotten worse the last few years. So I don't understand why that continues to be a problem because like the whole special team staff changed, right? We have a whole new coaching staff under bonus. You know, supposedly they were supposed to help fix things, and Arneal actually did fix the PK for a bit. It's gone back to being bad this year, but like last year's PK was actually pretty good. The power play, not so much. And the power play is, you know, what really needs to be a huge matchup strength for the Jets because they have the firepower to have, honestly, like a top 10 unit if we're, we're looking at a lot of other PP units around the league. The Jets absolutely have the skill to have one of the top power plays in the league. And even if it was just like NHL average, that would still be a huge improvement over what the Jets have now. Winnipeg's power play as it is, is among the league's bottom tier. And it's really hard to imagine because you just see how much skill there is, the kinds of shooters the Jets have, the kinds of passing ability that Winnipeg has, and somehow none of it really manifests into anything that's particularly dangerous. So the good news is the Jets can fix that. You know, it is something where with the right adjustments to how players rotate and what instructions they're given, the Jets power play in theory should be a lot better. We've already seen it be at least a bit more active since KFC is out. I think continuing that trend and continuing to add more movement and more deception would make the Jets power play really dangerous. I also think you need to look at the guys at the point. I love Josh Morrissey, but I feel like as a power play quarterback, that's not really his best role. I don't love Pionk there either, but Pionk at least gets the puck down low relatively uh, quickly, whereas Morrissey... He's kind of more of like a perimeter passer, and I feel like that's not really what the Jets need. Honestly, if he was placed on the right half wall, I wouldn't really mind that. I feel like Morrissey did pretty decently there as a shooter. Not, again, what I would do necessarily, but you know, if you have a choice between that or whatever he does at the point, I guess I would probably prefer the half wall. But you know, again, like I said, it's uh, picking not really ideal situations and choices given the circumstances. But you know, the Jets do have plenty of time to sort it out. They're going to want to do it sooner rather than later because it would also help them determine what they need when it comes to trade stuff. You know, are they looking for a finisher who's more of a power play specialist or do they want somebody who is versatile and can contribute in all facets of the game? A lot of stuff for the Jets to parse through. They are apparently still uh, receiving plenty of scouts. Anaheim and a number of other teams were in attendance at the Habs game. Maybe some of these teams are asking about stuff for the from the Jets. Uh, the Flyers were conspicuously absent. Maybe the maybe the courtship has ended. I don't know. But either way, Winnipeg has lots of options, and there is still plenty of time to get this power play back on track. 
Let me know your thoughts on these past couple of games and what you think is wrong with the special teams. Drop your thoughts in the comments below or at my social medias at HLLingLoco and at LO underscore Winnipeg Jets. For tonight's episode, though, that is going to be all the time that we have. Thanks so much for making Locked On Jets your first listen of the day every day. We'll be back here tomorrow with some thoughts ahead of the game against the Red Wings and talk about maybe some roster stuff the Jets can do to try and squeeze just a little bit more value out of this team. But as always, have a great night and go Jets go.